Hi, I'm David Lowry, writer and director of The Green Knight, and this is Notes on a Scene. Hold! I grew up just loving the Arthurian legends and all the stories of the knights and their quests, and at some point, a couple years ago, I just, I kind of felt like making a fantasy film. I really love movies like Willow and uh, Excalibur, and I just wanted to make one of my own. And I remembered this poem, I remembered the story, and thought that it would make an excellent template for uh, my own take on a, a medieval quest film. The scene we are watching today is the one in which Sir Gawain meets the Green Knight for the first time. Friends. So this shot right here is one of my favorites in the film because I'm a big fan of old-fashioned matte paintings and set extensions the way they would have done them in the 1980s or prior to that, all through cinema history up until digital took over, when artists would paint by hand and create these giant paintings on glass to help extend sets beyond what they were able to build. We couldn't get the camera this far back and I wanted this shot to be wider. And so pretty much everything from here, this stuff was all on set and everything else is painted in, including some of these people. Like these people are painted. There's a lady over here who's a painting. And I really wanted to uh, just see how far we could get with doing a hand-painted matte painting, including painting in the extras. In all the Star Wars films, like, you know, Return of the Jedi, whenever there was a big crowd scene, often those crowds were painted in. You know, often those were stormtroopers, so you could kind of get away with it a little bit more, but I was pretty sure that we could get some hand-painted extras in here. We didn't have a lot of extras on set, and so we were always shuffling people around, and so I really wanted to fill this shot in. Lighting this set was a real challenge, particularly because we, we finished building it the day before we, we shot on it. <laughs> so <laughs> I think probably this, the day we shot this, this image here uh, was you know, the day they finished building it. You know, we, we really were down to the wire and getting this set this large constructed. This scene takes place on Christmas Day and it's not meant to be night. So we had to have daylight coming through, and yet at the same time we wanted it to be really dark and moody and, and, and lit by fire. And so we have a couple little windows here and there throughout the scene. There's actually an opening way up here, way above at the top of the set, so that a circle of light can just come through and illuminate the round table. But it was a real partnership with Andrew Palermo, my cinematographer, and Jade Healy, my production designer. We really just spent a lot of time with models building up you know, the idea of what we wanted the set to be and working out where those light sources would be because we knew we just wouldn't have time to experiment before we had to start shooting. We really had to kind of build that in in advance. So all of the lighting was really designed very specifically before the set was even built. Brothers. Brothers. Brothers and sisters. Oh. So this is Sarita Chaudhary, who plays Morgan Le Fay, Gawain's mother, who traditionally is not Gawain's mother, but that's one of the main tweaks we've made to our telling of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And originally she was not part of this scene. Originally we left it a little bit more obtuse, a little bit more up in the air as to whether or not she had been the one who brought the Green Knight into King Arthur's court, who cast a spell that summoned him. As we were shooting the movie, we just kept wanting more and more of Sarita. I loved her, I loved what she brought to the role, and I knew that what she was doing was incredibly important to the film. And eventually that led to this entire scene, which wasn't in the screenplay, but has become one of my favorites, in which she and her sisters cast the spell that summons the Green Knight. This scene with Sarita here was one of the scenes that we had 100% storyboarded, because we had already shot everything in King Arthur's court when we shot this stuff. And so everything here was specifically designed to be intercut with King Arthur's speech and to have sort of the counterpoint to the very reverent, very traditional Christmas Day speech that King Arthur's uh, giving. And here we have the more pagan side of things, the old world magic that Morgan Le Fay represents. You have laid those same hands upon our Saxon brethren, who now in your shadow bow their heads like babes. I decided to make Gawain her son. And initially that was just out of narrative convenience. I just needed a better way to introduce Morgan Le Fay into the story. And I had a mother for Gawain already written. But as soon as I made her his mother, it really added a dimension to the story that had never existed there before. I thank thee for breaking bread with me this 
blessed day. All of these little plaques that are all over his costume. And each one of these represents something related not only to Arthurian lore, but to other films that I've made and that my collaborators have made. All over his costume are, you know, the ghost from Ghost Stories here. There's all sorts of like little clues, little details, little illusions that are, are built in. And every one of those matters. Every one of those little things was designed by somebody and contributes to not just the lore of this movie, but to our interpretation of who King Arthur was and what he means in a historical context. When I first started talking to Malgoja Terzanska, our costume designer, about what the king and queen would look like, obviously they need to have crowns, but I wanted them to not look like traditional medieval crowns. And she found lots of examples of, of crowns throughout all sorts of different cultures, including some South American cultures that we pulled from for these. But the other thing that I really liked about these was that it gives King Arthur and Queen Guinevere the appearance of religious icons. And they sort of represent, you know, Christendom, as it were. They represent the, the traditional establishment, the organized religion side of Western culture. And as such, I thought it was really important that they sort of almost, you know, have the countenance of saints. For out my window this morning I looked and I saw a land shaped By your hands. One of the amazing things about making a movie is when you have actors like Sean Harris, who I've always admired and I've always wanted to work with, and you get to cast them in a role like King Arthur, somewhat a part that he's never played before, never played a part like this, even though he's played many medieval characters before. The best thing I can do as a director is to just step back and follow their lead. And one of the things he brought to the table here, quite literally, was the idea of walking around the round table over the course of this speech. When I wrote the script and storyboarded the scene, my intention was for him to stand at the head of the table as he does at the beginning of the scene. We got there the day of the, you know, the day before we started shooting to do one quick rehearsal. And he stood there at the head of the table and said, well, I'm the king. Why wouldn't I just walk around the table to address my subjects? And that was something that he brought to the film was this warmth. But I, I am the luckiest here today. Because I am amongst thee. I had written a King Arthur who was dying, who was at the end of his reign, uh, who was very decrepit. And Sean played all those notes, but also brought a warmth, a sense of friendship and a love for his kingdom to the part. We only did the speech maybe three or four times. We did three or four takes of it, and that's all we needed. He really communicated so much, not just in the way he delivers it, but the way in which he moves through this space. And he defines the space in a way that I don't think we would have been able to had he not done that. Peace, peace you brought to your kingdom. So it is in peace that I, I now say to you, Handwriting is very important to me. It's something that I just keep coming back to in my movies. I love watching people write. I love watching people express themselves through their handwriting. I have terrible handwriting myself. <laughs> I can never write a letter that looks like this. We hired a calligrapher to do everything that you see here. I love handwritten letters. I love receiving them. I love writing them on the occasions that I rarely do write them. And all of my movies feature them in one way or another. And when I was trying to think about how I wanted to convey the sense of Morgan Le Fay casting this spell, I decided I just wanted to have her write a letter. And in doing so, turns a magical incantation to, into yet another aspect of the movie that feels incredibly personal to me. I am amongst thee. So, before we... I really wish that I could draw lines from one shot to the next because the way in which these scenes were intercut. King Arthur giving his speech and Morgan Le Fay casting a spell was one of the most challenging aspects of this entire production. And I think I spent probably a, you know, over a year cutting just this scene. And of course the rest of the movie I was cutting at the same time, but I would just, I'd work on a scene and then come back to this one, work on a different scene, come back to this one. I finished the movie once and then returned to this. And I just kept working on it over and over and over again, trying to get the cadence of everything just right you know, finding just syllables that I could cut out or trim or move around between what Sean was saying, between what Sarita was doing, and trying to get that rhythm just perfect. I am amongst thee. So, before we... 
Yeah, just having Sarita standing up, finding exactly what frame for her to rise so that she can begin walking in a circle in the same way that Sean is and bring her into that circular rhythm at exactly the right point. It was trial and error for a good 15 or 16 months, but the first version of it was probably 10 minutes longer than this. And it was all the same material. It was, everything was still there. All the speech was there. We didn't cut anything out of the speech. Just the rhythm of it was much slower and much more methodical. And we needed it to build. We needed to reach this, you know, culminating point where the Green Knight appears. And to ramp up to that required just a lot of little fine tuning in the edit room. Let's freeze frame on our green knight holding the branch of holly over his head as a sign of peace. He's approaching King Arthur's court uh, with, with friendship in his heart in spite of his monstrous visage. One of the funny things about shooting this scene was that Ralph Ineson, who plays the green knight, is an excellent horse rider. He knows how to ride a horse like nobody's business. But the horse that we'd had for him, it turned out to be in heat. So that lovely mare on that day was just not behaving. She just would not listen to him whatsoever. And so in this shot right here, he is uh, sitting upon a fake horse that our key grip built out of a uh, saddle and a bunch of speed rail. And in a lot of the shots where you don't see the horse, Ralph is riding that and we're just pushing him on a dolly. And eventually we got a second horse in, a horse that would behave and, and ride around the table as, uh, as we needed. But the first day of the Green Knight, walking into King Arthur's court was far less majestic on set than it appears in the actual film. There are no visual effects at all in the creation of the Green Knight. He is 100% a real character that we had on set looking exactly like he does in the movie. And I really wanted him to be a, a character in the film, to not be a visual effect. And so we cast Ralph, who I have you know, admired for years, ever since he was on The Office. Uh, and I loved him in The Witch. I've loved him in everything he's been in. And I knew that he was a tremendous actor and I knew that he would be able to give a performance through whatever prosthetics we put on his face. And then Barry Gower, our, our, our makeup designer, designed this incredible prosthetics that were designed around Ralph, and Malgoja built an amazing costume to complement that. And we really did our best to create a truly supernatural presence on film that still had a odd sense of humanity at the core. And we used a lot of old-fashioned tricks, like just having Ralph standing on a platform to make him feel bigger than Dev. Dev is quite tall in his own right, so we had to put him on quite a few like little decks to get him elevated above him. But nonetheless, we were able to just, you know, through trickery, sheer old-fashioned movie magic, create a presence on film that feels truly otherworldly, even though he was just 100% photographically a practical creation. As a filmmaker, it's really important to remind myself constantly that the movies I make aren't all that important. Someday they won't exist anymore. Someday they'll all fall away. They won't be around. Uh, to, they won't survive me as long as I sometimes think they will. And so more important than the legacy I'm creating for myself with my body of work is the way I comport myself as I make them. The integrity with which I live my life and my attempts to be a good person, to do good in this world. And I wanted that to be one of the central conceits of this film, because here is a character who has a tremendous legacy laid out ahead of him. He is related to King Arthur, one of the greatest kings of medieval history. He could be the successor of the throne, but it was important for me to make sure that his journey carried him to a place where he realized that more important than that legacy was the idea of being a human being with integrity and with goodness in their heart, and that's what I wanted to convey in The Green Knight.